It's your open source advocate and I'm back and today I wanted to cover one that you guys have requested in the past and I've kind of not done it and it's just been something that I haven't gotten to but it's actually a really useful tool and I've been using it a little bit here and there lately um, especially now that I've got some clients that I do some uh, IT work for. So it's uh, Wacamole. Now if you've never heard of this before some people call it guacamole. Um, if you're from the south along the, the southern border of the United States or from any country that speaks Spanish you'll know that it's pronounced guacamole like a W on the front but that's okay. It doesn't matter how you pronounce it as long as you understand that it's some amazing open source software that allows you to use your web browser to create a VNC connection or an RDP connection or an HTML connection or all kinds of different connections to remote systems that you want to get on the desktop. It's really, really a great tool. It's got a great layout. It's got some really great features. Now, the workflow to me is a little bit strange occasionally and a little bit troublesome. I wish there were some easier ways to navigate around, but that's the great thing about open source is you can make those requests for updates and see if they get put in there, or you can clone that source, that code, and go learn how it's put together and make those changes yourself. And sometimes the changes for the visual aspect of, of these software things is a little bit easier than it is really getting into the meat and bones of the back end work that goes into making everything function, but sometimes not. So it just depends on you as a programmer, if you feel like you're a programmer or have any kind of programming capabilities uh, versus what you want done. So sometimes it's just nice to put in a request and see if they're willing to do it. Sometimes maybe you could fund it. There's great sites out there like Fiverr and, and just so I can't even name them all. Honestly, Fiverr just comes to mind right away. But where you can basically put out a bounty of I will pay twenty five dollars to somebody to make this kind of change on this software and just see if anybody takes you up on it. They might be willing to do it. You just never know. And it could be totally worth it. I had a I had a project that I did one of these uh, videos on called Bitlink. Um, and I wanted to see if somebody could dockerize it for me, basically. So I paid somebody out there, and I think I paid $100 to somebody, and he put it into Docker, and I was able to use Docker to pull it down and get it running and everything like that. It was really cool, and he even committed that back to the project afterwards as part of the agreement. So that was great, right? Um, I think there's some really cool stuff out there. So talking about Wacamole, um, I was watching the self-hosted Reddit. So if you've never been over there, you should definitely go over to reddit.com slash r slash self-hosted and, and join that Reddit and, and pay attention to it because there's lots of really great stuff that gets put on there. There's lots of questions and you might be able to help answer some of those questions too, but there's lots of really great stuff that gets put on there just for, for different open source software you might be interested in. Um, but I saw this post by this guy and he said, you know, I've taken that old uh, Osnew Wacamole Docker container that just hasn't been updated in a while and it's kind of deprecated. He says, and I updated it and I made something of my own. So he's got this really, you know, nice little screenshot. And then he's got basically this very simple command for Docker run. Uh, you can also run it on your, on your Raspberry Pi. So your ARM v7 Raspberry Pi can also run this thing. So if you guys are ARM folks and you're interested in doing it that way, just remember it's out here. But then he's got parameters. He defines out what those things are. You can add the extensions, which has been a hard thing for me with the Osnew stuff. I haven't figured out how to add the uh, TOTP. So I've been using Othelia in front of the Wacamole, which I like. And I'll show you guys how to do that on this video. And uh, yeah, so he's got some really great stuff out here. So you can add some different ways of authentication for the extensions and such. Uh, I think that's really cool that he added that as well. And then he did provide us a really nice Docker Compose file right here that I think we could just use in a stack on Portainer. So maybe we'll do it that way today and kind of see how that works. But I'll show you how to set up the Docker Compose. So we're going to do a few things today. We're going to set up Wacamole basically in Docker and we're going to use that Docker Compose file we just looked at. We'll, we'll set it up for Docker Compose and then we'll use Portainer to also push it out there because I think Portainer is another amazing open source project. And it's basically a nice GUI for your Docker system. So we're going to install that thing. Then we're going to make sure that it's functioning. We're going to set up an RDP session uh, to a remote uh, virtual machine that I've got with Windows on it just to make sure it's all working correctly. Uh, once we've done that, I'm going to go in and set up Nginx Proxy Manager so that we can actually have a URL back to our Wacamole instance instead of using the IP address. And then we're going to put Othelia in front of that so that we have basically Othelia protecting our Wacamole instance. So it's going to be basically like two-factor authentication with Othelia and then another one factor with Wacamole login. So we'll do that also. And then finally, we're going to get out there and we're just going to check out some of the extra things that you can do in Wacamole as a system as the user interface works. So I'll have times uh, stamped in the description below the video as always. So make sure if you want to jump ahead, if you already know how to do this, 
feel free to skip ahead and check out the other parts of the video. Skip around if you want to. Um, I just hope you'll enjoy this and get something out of it. So we're going to get into it right after this. I just want to say thank you so much to all of my patrons over at Patreon. I just cannot tell you how much I appreciate your support, how much I appreciate that you appreciate my content. It really just means so much to me. As well, thank you to all my subscribers on YouTube. If you'd like to support me over on Patreon, check in the description. I'll have a link where you can jump over to Patreon and become a subscriber. I put all the videos there as well so you can see those every week and you don't have to depend on the algorithms in YouTube to make sure that you get them. And it just really means so much to me when you support me that way. So thank you again so much. All right, so when we look at this thing, the first thing that I notice is that he's got a nice Docker Compose file down here as we talked about earlier. And I love Docker Compose because it makes it really easy to get something set up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this and I'm just going to copy it. Now, one of the things that I don't really go through a lot with you guys, and I kind of want to touch on it again, is that you really shouldn't do things as the root user of a system. So I've set up this virtual machine in Proxmox, and I'm going to go ahead and just create a user that's not the root user. So I want to run through that with you guys. Now, there's this command. Don't type this, but there is user add, and then you can put in the name. But then you have to go create the home directory and do a whole bunch of other things for it. Um, so this is kind of what I call the, the harder way. The easier way is to actually use the command add user and then put in the username you want. And when you hit enter, it's going to come up and it's going to ask for your password. So what password do you want for this user? So type that in and then confirm it. And it's going to ask you a few questions. Now you can fill these out or you can leave them blank just by hitting enter. You don't have to fill them out. And once you get to the end, it's just going to ask, are you sure this is all correct? Just hit Y and hit enter and it's going to create that user for you. And now if I do ls slash home, you'll see that it created the home directory for that user for me, which is really super great. So in order to give myself pseudo capabilities, I'm gonna do user mod dash A, a little a and capital G, and then I'm gonna type in the name of the group, which is pseudo, and then the name of the user I just created, which is my name in this case, so Brian. So you guys can follow along and do this with me, but once you hit that, I'm now the user uh, pseudo, so I can just do log out. I'm gonna do SSH, and I'm gonna put in that username I just created, 192. 168.10.147 and it's going to ask do you trust this machine yes i do and i'm going to type in my super user password and i'm in so if i clear that out you can see now that i am inside of the ubuntu 2004 container that i created for this particular purpose And I've got to do a couple of other things. I don't have Docker installed yet. If I do Docker V, you see it doesn't know what that is. If I do Docker Compose dash V, it also doesn't know what that is. So I need to install Docker and Docker Compose. And honestly, I want to install Nginx Proxy Manager or Portainer and, and some of those things on this server so that I can make that easy. So the thing that I've got is I've made this script um, and, I, and I use it on everything I do. And I've shown it in videos in the past. But I've got this script out here on GitHub. So I'm going to open up a new tab. I'm going to go to github.com and I'll have this linked in the show notes and the description so you guys can find it pretty easily. I just go to my page. And I'm going to go to the Docker installs repository right here. And down here is this script that we want to grab. So I'm going to click into it. And then over here, I'm going to click on raw. So you can see that down here in the bottom right. And that just gives me all of this code. So what I can do is I can just highlight this uh, URL. I can do this a couple of ways, or I could just highlight the code and create a file and paste it in there. But I'm, I'm going to highlight that URL. I'm going to copy it, and I'm going to go back here. So I'm going to do wget, and I'm, I may not have wget installed yet. We'll find out. No, it does. So it's there. Okay, cool. So it pulled that down. So now if I do an ls, there is my install script. Now it's not executable yet. So if I do ls-al, you can see here's the install script. And right now there's no X. See, it's RW, but no X. RW, no X, R, no X. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to just CHMOD and then do plus X and then that file. Now, if we do LS-AL, let's clear this, make it easier. You can see now it's got the X's, which means it's executable, which means I can now run this script on the system. Uh, yeah, if you don't have curl, you do install it. So we're going to do uh, sudo apt install curl. I should probably just try to install curl if you don't have it, but it's fine. I'm just going to rerun that real quick and let it get through that process. So I'm going to do dot slash install just like this. And I just tab, I do tab to complete. So if you guys didn't know, you could do that in the terminal. You can do dot slash and then start typing. And if it's, a, if it's a file that it can auto complete. So in this case where I'm telling it, try to execute this, it needs to be executable. 
I can just hit tab and it's going to try to autocomplete. Now, if there's a lot of other files that start with INS or INST, uh, it's not going to just autocomplete. You hit tab two times, it'll give you options, and then you can kind of keep going trying to type it out. So uh, pretty cool in the terminal. But anyways, we're going to hit this. We're going to let this thing run. And I know it goes all the way to the bottom of the screen, but that's just how the script works. But you can see here I've got my choices. I've got one for CentOS 7 and 8, two for Debian 10 and 11, uh, three for Ubuntu 18.04. I've got number four for Ubuntu 20.04, which is what this is, or 21.04. I've got five for Arch. I have not been able to test this on Arch, so if anybody tries this on Arch and has any issues, please go over to GitHub and let me know that you had an issue and what I can try to do to fix it. I will try my best. Um, and then six says basically in the installer, I didn't really mean to run this. So I'm going to use number four. And then it's going to ask me for my super user password. So that's fine. I'm going to type that in. Script's going to continue. It says, do you want to install Docker CE? I'm going to hit Y. And then Docker Compose. Yes. Nginx Proxy Manager. Now, if you don't have Nginx Proxy Manager, you might want to install it. In my case, I have it running on a different machine on my network. So I'm going to use that one. But if you don't have it yet, go ahead and install that as well if you want to. I'm going to hit no for this one, but you might hit yes. Uh, Portainer. Yes. Or no, that's... Uh, and I do, I do have Navidrome in here as well. I don't need it for this one. Um, I also gave you a speed test. So for recurring internet speed tests, I also don't need that for this one. But I have a couple of extra things that will install if you want it to there. Um, and then now we're going to do Pertainer, and I'm going to say yes. Now it's going to ask me, do I want Pertainer CE or Pertainer Agent? The difference is Pertainer CE is the full web GUI that you will log into this IP address of this host uh, at port 9000 basically and create an account and you'll have full portainer. If you already have a full portainer and you just want to set up the agent to link those two together and kind of use it all from one place, then you would use option two, which is portainer agent. And again, option three will cancel the installation of portainer basically. So I'm going to say number one on this one just to make it easy. Now it's going to install Docker CE, the community edition. That shouldn't take very long. So here I tell you that I added your user to the Docker group, which means if you log out and back in, you won't have to use the sudo command in front of all of the Docker commands and things. Um, so that's valuable to do. But for now, I'm going to install Docker Compose. It's going to tell you the version of Docker Compose. And we're going to install Portainer here. And basically that just uses, again, Docker to do that. So it gets everything set up for you. And it's going to tell you that everything is done and you should go to the portainer on the host name or IP address of the server on port 9000 to create your admin user. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to log out and I'm just going to go right back in as that should get my user set where I don't have to do sudo docker to do the commands. There we go. I don't. So I can do docker ps. And we can see right here we've got Portainer running. So let me clear this uh, Docker PS. There we go. We've got Portainer running, and it tells us that it's running on these ports. So that's good. That's what we want. Uh, so we'll clear that. So now we've got Docker up and running. We've got Docker CE running. We've got Portainer running. But we want to go over to the admin side here real quick and actually set this thing up. So I'm going to go to that IP address of that machine. And it's colon 9000 and that's going to bring me to the portainer ui for the first run and it wants to know my username and i don't like to use admin um, so i'm going to use brian and my password is going to be a strong password and we're going to say create user and there we go. Now, when you first come into to Pertainer, you want to say get started. So either you're going to add environments or you're going to get started. So I'm going to get started. And it sees right here automatically it found this local version, which is great. Now you can close this little thing to get a little more real estate here. But you see immediately it finds this local system. And you can see it's got one thing running, and that's itself. It sees itself running, and it shows you some details about it. So pretty great. So we don't really need this right this second. First, we're going to go through and kind of set this up in the Docker Compose method. So we're going to go back here. I'm going to highlight this Docker Compose information from the guacamole system we want. And I'm going to go back here. And I'm just going to make this in a structure that is fairly good, uh, in my opinion, for keeping all my Docker stuff together. Now, some people say you should put it in opt. Some people say don't put it in home. It's very much up to you. But if we go to cd slash opt, uh, and we look, there's not a lot here. So we've got container D. 
So I could say make directory docker, and it's not going to let me because I'm, I don't have the permissions for slash opt. That's the reason I do it in home so that I'm not doing everything as sudo. So I'm going to go back to my home directory, and I'm gonna just going to say make directory docker. I'm going to cd into that directory, and if I do ls, there's nothing there. Now I'm going to make a directory for wakamole, and if I spell it correctly, there we go. I'm going to cd into that directory now. And you see there's nothing there. So I'm going to create a docker-compose.yml file. So nano space docker-compose.yml. Hit enter. And we're going to do control shift and V like Victor. And we're going to paste. And now you can see I've got this entire docker compose file set up. And we're ready. So I can just save this. Hit enter. And then I can exit. And from there, if I, if I don't need to make any changes to that folder, I can just say docker compose up dash D. This is going to pull down that image, do everything that it needs to do, and it's going to bring it up and it's going to get it running. Now I'm going to go back. I'm going to open up that Docker compose file again. There are changes that you may want to make. So there's a volume that it sets up called Postgres and it's not really set anywhere. So I like to do dot slash. So I'm going to change this from version two to version three. So it'll take the dot slash. Dot slash means put this in the current location where this where this file is, which means in the Wakamole directory. So I want that so that it's all together. So that's the reason I make that change. 8080 is a very common port. So I don't really like to use 8080 um, as my as my host port. So on the on the ports, you can change the left side, just not the right side. The, the left side is the host, like the host machine. The right side is the container. So we don't want to we don't want to mess with this right side, but this left side we can change. So I'm going to try to change this. I'm going to change it to 8190. So our volumes are Postgres, driver is local. Okay, that's really all we have to change. So I'm going to do Control O again. And I'm just going to highlight this and copy these changes. And then I'm going to exit out of Nano with Control X and I'm going to clear this out. Now again, once I've made those changes, I can do Docker Compose up dash D just like this and this thing's going to try to pull down and run everything we need. Now if I want to do it from Portainer which was the whole point of installing Portainer I'm going to make this a little larger for you guys. I'm going to go to my stacks right here. I'm going to create a new stack and I'm going to call this Wacamole and I'm going to go here and I'm going to paste in that code that I had already and really that's all we have to do. We've, we've done it, we've pasted it. Now, if you just paste it straight from his site and you need to make these changes, then don't forget to make those changes. But now we can just hit deploy and it's gonna do the same thing as running it as a Docker compose file with the Docker compose up dash D command. So either way you do that, you can, you can definitely get it done. So I'm just gonna hit, let me make sure I've got everything selected correctly. Everything here looks good. Yes, I'm gonna hit deploy. So you can see it starts spinning. It's going to go try to grab this image. It's going to pull it down to my local system, and then it's going to spin that up as a container, and the container name is going to be Wacamole. All right, it gives us a green check that says, hey, I created the stack. Now, that doesn't mean everything is running, but you can see that the stack's been created. Now, if we go to our containers right here on the left, you can kind of check out what's here, and it says that it's running. So this is the nice thing about Portainer. We can go right here and click on Logs. And kind of check our logs and see what it says is going on here. So it says HTTP NIC 8080. So it looks like it thinks it's up and running. So everything there is looking pretty good. So now if we go out here to the right, you'll see that it set up the port mapping that we wanted. So if we click on this, uh, first thing we may have to do is go to our environments. Uh, when, you, when you get this set up, go to your environment, click on local. And right here on this public IP, you want to put in the IP address of your host. Make sure that that's there. And then just save that. Now, if we go back to our containers and we click, that should try to take us to that host on that port, and it did. And here's Wacamole up and running. We get a nice little login screen. And initial login is guac admin for the username and the password. So G-U-A-C-A-D-M-I-N. I'm going to click on login. Just tell it don't save for now. And this is really the interface that you get. So not anything here yet because we haven't set anything up. But if you go over here under the user, you'll see there's settings. We're going to click on settings. 
And the first thing I like to do is go to users and I'm going to add a new user. You can't really change the Guac Admin user, but you can delete it here in a minute. But you can't be logged in as Guac Admin and delete the user. You need to be logged in as a different user. So we're going to go here to new user. And I'm just going to create my new user. And you should do the same thing. So I'm going to don't click, don't create it as me unless your name is also Brian. But put in a strong password. Confirm your password. And then you can put in all of the other information if you want to. If you have a team that you're going to be letting use this thing, you definitely want to fill out all the information that you can just to make it a little bit more professional for one thing, but also so you can tell who's who because sometimes you have people with the same name and uh, it helps separate them out a little bit. And my role is the admin. Okay. Now, if you want to say login disabled, then that person can't log in. I'm not sure why you would create this user if they can't log in, but hey, there may be reasons whether their password is expired or not. So you could create their password the first time and just set this as expired and that's going to force them to change it. So you give them the one you created. It could be a simple one like password one, two, three, four, you know, exclamation point, and then let them change it when they first log into something strong that's their own that you don't know. And that takes away any kind of weirdness about you. You can also set up expiration dates and things like that. Uh, permissions. So in my case, I want to have all of the permissions. So I'm just going to check all of these boxes. Now, I don't have any connections set up yet, but once you do, this tab enables right here, and you can click on that, and then you can allow that person access to certain um, systems that you already have set up. So you might want to go set up systems. So set up your admin user, go set up systems, then add the other users, and you can basically allow them access to certain systems or not certain, certain systems, and it just gives you a lot of really good control over who can access which systems, which I think is great. So we're going to hit Save. There we go. We've got a new user. So I'm going to log out as walk admin. And now I'm going to log in as my new user. So now we're logged in again. So I'm just going to go here. I'm going to go back to settings and I'm going to go back to users. And now I'm going to get rid of this one here called walk admin. So I'm just going to click on it, which puts you kind of in edit mode. And if you go to the bottom, you'll see there's this delete button. I'm going to hit delete and I'm going to hit delete. And now you can see that that generic user is gone. I've gotten rid of a security vector from my system. It's not all of them for sure, but I got rid of one, which is great. Now you can create groups. So groups of people and groups of machines. So sometimes this is useful if you have machines that you that you host on your home network that you're trying to keep track of. And then you have a business like me and you're trying to access machines outside of your network for that business. You might want to create multiple groups and separate those machines by those groups because it makes it easier to find them. You can see a history of what's being done here, of course, once everything gets going. You can see if there's any active sessions and you can filter those things to kind of see what's going on and you can kill those sessions if you need to. And then, of course, we have basically the connections area where we can add connections. So you can add a connection group or you can add a new connection that's just a connection. And then finally, you have preferences. So you can go through and set up your preferences for the system right here. Um, pretty simple, pretty basic setup. but very useful for you to go through and kind of set these things up as well. Make sure you have the correct time zone set and everything like that. So I'm going to go back to connections. I'm going to create a new connection. Now right here, I'm just going to call this Win 10 because it's the only Windows 10 machine I have on my network. If your machine, if you have a lot of Windows 10 machines or Windows machines you're accessing, you should get the machine name and use that as the name right here. Uh, the location for root, this is not like the user root. This just means like it's not in a group. So if you had groups, you would put this into a group instead of root, basically. Um, that's all that is. And then VNC is not the connection I want. I want RDP. But you can see here you have other options. You have SSH, Telnet, VNC, and Kubernetes connection. So that's pretty cool. So I'm just going to go with RDP for now. Uh, the maximum number of connections. I mean, you know, Windows has limits and you may be able to work around those things, but just be aware that you can set this if you have people that are accessing like a, um, maybe a session on a Linux machine or something like that. So you can set limits so you don't have too many people accessing it once. So just be aware of that too. Uh, in this case, I'll set one and one because I don't need to have multiple active sessions going. And then connection weight. So if you have load balancing set up, you can set these things up. It's nothing that I've got, nothing that I'm going to go through right now. Um, this is the proxy parameters. If you're using like a gateway, uh, we don't need that. And the same thing here if you're using an RDP gateway. Um, what we want is down here. And we're going to go right here to this section. 
we're going to put in the host name, which in this case is the IP address. And for my machine, it is 237. And the port for uh, RDP is 3389. So if you don't know, you can always go check those things out. But if you've changed it, you need to put in the correct port for that. And the username for that system and the password for that system. Make sure I type it correctly. Good. And the domain, if you have a domain that that system is on, you may want to set this. In my case, I just leave it as the default work group. I, I didn't change any of that, so nothing to set there. And then I check this box. If you don't want it to ignore that server certificate, if that server certificate is part of your security policy, you should not check this box. But I check this box because I did not set up a server certificate, so it's going to gripe in the background, and I'm not going to see that, and it's going to make it not connect, basically. If you're using a remote desktop gateway, then you should also set this uh, set of parameters. It's nothing that I'm using. So here you can set up some basic settings. If you have an initial program that you want to open as soon as somebody logs into this remote desktop session, you can set the path to that program executable here, and then it should open up whenever they log in. I don't have any of that, but that's set there. You can change the keyboard layout. I mean, there's just so many different things you can do here, and you can read through a lot of these options yourself, of course. Um, you can enable multi-touch if you expect that this is attaching to some device that's running on a tablet and you need multi-touch gestures. Um, the admin console you can also set up if you want to. It's nothing I need to set up in this case. Now the display. So if you want to limit the width and height of the display, you can do that. But what I like to do is I come down to... I do color depth. Uh, depending on your network connection, you can do more or less. Um, if you need to be faster and you're noticing it's kind of slow, kind of drop it down a little bit and see how it does. But I like to do this one. It seems to work pretty well here on my local network. Um, you can say force lossless compression. I I'm just not going to do that either. And then I like to use this option here that says display update. And I think this got added for Windows 7. Maybe it was Windows Vista, but Basically, in certain versions of RDP, the screen will just auto scale, and I'll kind of show you that when we log in. So you have options for clipboard copying from the remote system back and forth. You can disable that if you want to. Um, device redirection. So if you want to set up other printers and other kinds of devices here, you can do that as well. Again, it's nothing that I have to set up, but be aware that it's there, and you can go through and set that stuff up. Um, I do like to enable the wallpaper, even though that slows your connection down a little bit. So it depends on you. If you don't like that, just leave it turned off. So they've got all these other things you can enable. I would say each one of these things slows down your connection a little bit more. So it's kind of up to you whether you want that or not. But I like arrow. I don't turn on, you know, these things. So um, screen recording. So if you're going to record the screen and what you're doing, you can set those things up here, those parameters. There's nothing, again, that I'm going to be doing. SFTP, if you have SFTP set up or you need to set it up so that you can do some SFTP from the remote system, you can do that here. And then if you need to do wake on LAN, so basically if the machine is allowed to sleep or hibernate, but you want it to wake up when it gets a signal from somebody trying to log in, you would check this box and put in the proper parameters. I think we've got everything we need to make the connection, so I'm going to hit save. And you'll see here now I've got this uh, single machine, but I can't get to it from here. This is just going to let me edit the machine. So um, be aware that this is, this is you're still in settings. So you need this is one of those workflow things that I talked about that's a little bit weird to me, which is a little bit easier to get in and out of this. But... I'm going to click on home and now I can see my connection and now I'm going to click on it and it says connected to Wacamole waiting for response so it's trying to connect to my machine on the remote system. Now this was a completely rebooted Windows 10 machine so it's going to actually do the whole login and there it is we've got our Windows 10 system up on our screen and we are logged in through the web browser as you can see and it does scale so I'm going to take this I'm going to kind of grab it and I'm going to minimize it here. So you see how it scales whenever I do that. And if I grab this corner, you see still it scales down as much as it can, which is pretty nice. That's kind of a cool feature. And that's that little, uh, that's that little piece that I set up earlier uh, where it scales basically. Now, this is just getting into Wacamole straight to the IP address and really kind of using that setup to, to access it. So I'm just going to go here and I'm going to say, uh, let's see, go to the user and go to log out. <clears throat> and when we sign out, it should come up and tell us that we've basically disconnected from that system. There we go. And you can say reconnect or we can just go ahead and say home. So I'm just going to go back to home and you can see here you get kind of a little tile of what it what it was at. So if you just close the tab and then come back later, it's going to show you a tile where it was 
uh, open and running or trying to log in, just depending on what it was doing last, it kind of gets like a little screenshot to show you there. And then as you build up more uh, more systems and you access more systems, this grid builds across where you can see kind of the last time that somebody was logged in. So pretty nifty. And then they've got some filters here. So if you have a lot of systems, you can filter through those pretty quickly to find the one you're looking for to also access it that way. So this is Wacamole RDP. Now, a couple of things I want to do because I said we would do this is I want to set up Nginx Proxy Manager to point us at this system. So we're going to go open up the Nginx Proxy Manager uh, site here uh, for me. So on mine, it's on my private network only. And basically, Nginx Proxy Manager is just a proxying service that lets you set up URLs and then forwards those things you know, basically around your network so that I can go in from outside my network and hit my Wacamole instance. So you'll see that I've already got one set up, but we're just going to add a new one. And I'll zoom this up a little bit for you guys to make it easier. So I'm going to call this uh, just guacamole.routemehome.org. And routemehome.org is mine. I own that. It is not something I just made up on the fly. I actually own this domain and I have this domain pointing to my home IP address. And here I'm going to put in the IP address of the server. Now, if it's the same server that you have Nginx Proxy Manager running on and you've created a Docker network for Nginx Proxy Manager to run in and you put your servers, your other containers inside that same network, you use the container name. But in this case, it's running on a completely separate machine. So I'm going to put in the private IP of that machine on my network. And then I'm going to put in uh, that port number that it's running on. And I'm going to tell it, you know what, WebSocket support I want, block common exploits, yes. And I'm gonna, right now I'm going to leave it publicly accessible, but we can change it later. I'm just going to hit save. I'm going to let it create that. And I'm just going to click on it right here to make sure that it actually opens up and takes me to my login page, which it does. That's good. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to edit that one. So I'm going to click on the little three dots here at the end. I'm going to click on edit. I'm going to go to the SSL page and I'm going to say request a new SSL certificate. And this is going to pull a Let's Encrypt certificate. So it's a valid certificate. I'm going to say force SSL and I'm going to agree to their terms of service and put my email in here and I'm going to hit save. So it's going to go out and it's going to run that challenge from Let's Encrypt to try to say, hey, I've got everything set up that I need in order to make this HTTPS site work. And if it doesn't give me an error, if it just goes away like it just did, that should be good. I'm going to click on it one more time. And now you see we get the HTTPS up here and it's got the little lock and it tells you it's a valid certificate. So now I should be able to log in. If I use the right password there, yes, and we're in again. Now if I go and click on this, it should try to connect back to that machine. And there it goes, it's logging in. So everything now is working over SSL. So basically nothing's going over uh, the network, the internet or anything else over HTTP, it's going over HTTPS. And so if I open up uh, the file explorer here, no less software center, ugh. So if I open up the file explorer right here, I can drag that around. You see there's a little bit of laggy, a little bit of choppiness, but not much. I mean, this is really, you know, for, for doing whatever I need to do remote real quick on a Windows machine, this is great. I'm not going to be gaming on this or anything. I'm not going to be watching videos or movies, but I could definitely do what I need to do here real quick and get everything going. There's my context menu. And if I wanted this to be a little bit faster, I could go back into those settings in Guacamole and turn off the background, turn off the, the window dragging, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that would make it go a little bit quicker too. So you have those options to try to make things a little bit faster. So I'm just going to close that. And again, I'm going to log back out. I'm going to click on home and we're going to go back to our setup over here. Now, if you'll remember on his site, he had these options that said, Hey, you can set these other things up that are basically extensions. So here you can see it says extensions and you can basically put this in and it's an environment variable. Now, this is a little bit different uh, whenever you're starting to use Stacks versus Docker Compose because Stacks doesn't do environment variables quite the same way. Um, we can try it and see if it works, but as I recall, there's a, there's a little bit of a weirdness with environmental variables, but we'll try it. Um, so he's got this one called Auth T-O-T-P, and if we look at the syntax right here, uh, we can see that it's extensions equals, and you just put in whatever that 
that particular extension is that you want. So I'm going to go back to my stack over here. And I'm going to click into my stack. I'm going to click on the editor. And I'm going to add an environment section. And I think that's all we need, but let's just look at his documentation one more time. Here he has it in quotes. I don't think we need it in quotes in Docker Compose. So I think we're good. We'll try it and see what happens. If it gives us an error, we'll know we didn't do it right. So we've got that set and we're just gonna say, uh, update the stack. And this is the same as making a change inside of your Docker Compose.yaml file and doing Docker Compose up dash D again. So it says it was successful in pushing out the stack. So we can click here and we see the stack right there. We can go to our containers. We see that it says it's running. We can check our logs. Make sure nothing looks weird. We don't see a bunch of errors or anything. It says extension TOTP, uh, TFA authentication. So it looks like it's trying to get that. Okay, cool. And it looks like it started the server. All right, so let's go back over to our server here. And we're just gonna refresh. And now we see the login again. Now I haven't set up the TOTP stuff. Let's see what it does. Okay, it's gonna bring us to set it up the first time. Uh, I'm gonna get rid of this afterwards, so don't worry about it. If you feel like <laughs> scanning that QR code, have at it. But you wanna have a TOTP app, so I've got one here on my phone. And I'm gonna put in the scan the code thing, and there it goes. And I'm just going to pick an icon. I don't think there's one for guacamole in here. Uh, let me check though. And I'm going to type it into the field so that it can check that I've got everything set up correctly. And if it doesn't like it, it's going to tell me. Pretty sure I'm typing it correctly. There we go. I guess I typed it wrong the first time. So now I've got my two-factor authentication set up for Wacamole RDP. So that's all you have to do. And again, I will put that in the show notes uh, for you guys so you can grab that, uh, basically that text that we're using. And everything will be really simple for you to get set up either through Portainer or through Docker Compose, whichever you want. Uh, and again, we can just click on this and we should be able to get back into our Windows uh, operation here. It's going to log us back in. You can see how smooth that is on that little spinner. I mean, it's not like there's a lot of jarring or it's not skipping frames or whatever you want to call it. Um, so yeah, I mean really pretty good. If we click on this, we can just go log right back out again and go back to the home. Now, the other thing that you can do and what I like to do is you can go and set up Othelia to be in front of your guacamole install. And that's what I prefer to do. So what I'm gonna do is instead of doing it on this one because I've got a whole video on Othelia and honestly it needs an entire video and there's other videos out there and I'm going to do an update video in the next few weeks on it just because it does need an update but it's a really cool system that lets you basically have your own login setups uh, inside of Nginx Proxy Manager doing some proxying and things like that so anytime you try to go to a URL it basically says oh hey wait you've got to authenticate first which I really like now it's not the authentication tied into Wacamole it's kind of like doing it twice but for me, that feels really secure when I know I've got my machines or client machines or other machines that are accessible through that system that anybody could potentially access through a URL. I want them to have to struggle to get past Othelia. And then once they get past that, I want them to struggle to get past Wacamole. So that's kind of my ideal situation, which I really like. All right, so when I go into this URL, which I use for my personal systems at home, you see you come up against basically Othelia first. And this is the Othelia login screen, so I have to put in my Othelia credentials. And then once I get past that, I'm going to get a two-factor authentication prompt. So I'm going to put in my username and then my password. I'm going to hit sign in. Now you can use remember me if you want to. And now it's going to prompt me, you see, for my one-time password. And it's going to check that, and then it's going to take me to the login screen for Wacamole. Once you get to this, now you can log into your Apache Wacamole, and this is gonna be a second set of credentials and a second two-factor authentication. So basically, you can set up two-factor authentication twice, and if you make everything different, 
So that's just that much more protection for your system. And you want to set up credentials that are different for Othelia and different for Apache. And of course have separate TOTP icons and everything like that for it. So they're not the same. You don't want it to, to be so easy that somebody can just log right in. And especially when you're thinking about protecting your network and your computers and your machines on your network. And if you're trying to access those things remote from away from your home or away from your business, you want that to be as protected as possible. So I like this option. Now, for a lot of you, Two-factor authentication one time might be plenty. That's great. Do that if that makes you feel better. Uh, me personally, I just feel better having two-factor authentication twice on my systems. So I wanted to talk about that very briefly. Uh, the, the Othelia thing, trust me, you, you're going to want to go watch the whole video on Othelia so that you can understand how it all works together. And there's several good videos out there. In fact, uh, Ebracorp just did one not too long ago, um, an update on their Othelia video, and it's truly tremendous. I suggest you go watch it. I'm going to do an update video pretty soon as well, so kind of watch for that as well. But that's Wacamole. I mean, you've got a really great system there for doing remote desktop application access. You can do it through the browser. It's pretty fast if you're using RDP. VNC is always a little bit laggy to me because it's doing it in a different way. I really prefer RDP, and I wish there was something better for Linux-based systems than RDP, but there is XRDP that you can try to install in your different Linux desktops. I will say that GNOME 3 and GNOME 4 generally have serious issues with RDP for some reason, but there are some guides out there that, that say they can get you around that. If you're running a desktop that uses Wayland, you are not going to be able to do remote desktop today as far as I am aware. Now, if that's changed, let me know, but as far as I know, that's just not going to work for you. You have to use something that uses X or X11 for the, for the screens and everything like that. Um, it's just not going to work with Wayland. So be aware of that if you try to set up Linux and it's using Wayland, you're probably going to have a really hard time with remote desktop access. Uh, other than that, I think Wacamole is a terrific, terrific tool. I hope you guys like it. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, like, subscribe, tell your friends about it so they can come along the journey with us. And I'll talk to you next time. Oh.